Good afternoon, guests, and welcome to the weekly with Dr. Tom. This is your way to stay up to date with everything healthcare related across the country. Today, we'll be joined by UBC nephrologist Dr. Nadia Zolinardo to discuss diabetes kidney health. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the seminar. Submit your questions throughout by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Elliott will answer as many questions as possible live, but all will be answered by case managers in writing. Now, here's Dr. Tom. Thank you, Tristan, and good afternoon, viewers, and welcome to the 15th edition of The Weekly. I'll introduce our special guest, kidney specialist, Dr. Nadia Zalonado, shortly. A number of family physicians have been joining the webinar, and I've promised them that I will do a weekly update on everything that is new and important to them from a therapeutics point of view. So here goes. The uh, annual American Diabetes Association meeting uh, wrapped up a week ago. Uh, it was done virtually, which is, a, which is a first, of course. And there were lots of uh, papers presented, but nothing really earth-shatteringly new. I can tell you that SGLT2 inhibitors, the class of drug that many of you are on, that would be uh, ampigaflozin and canagaflozin and dapigaflozin. These drugs improve, improve kidney function. And I think, uh, I suspect Dr. Zalonato will, might say a word or two about them. Interestingly, they seem to delay the onset of type one diabetes in kids. Um, we saw lots of uh, presentations about closed loop pump systems. They keep getting better, but of course you know that because you've been watching the weekly. What about an update on BC diabetes ac activities? We're working harder than ever to get coverage for CGM and Tristan will be speaking to our Uh, petition at change.org later. Um, the, the other big big news is uh, that we are going nuclear on, on the artificial pancreas. Viewers will be aware that the technology is just amazing, particularly the open source technology combining the, uh, the Omnipod pump and the Dexcom G6. So we will be doing installations. We will be starting people on this looping system at BC Diabetes in the coming weeks. Uh, let's get back to our focus, which is diabetes and kidney health. You know, I could have been a diabetes specialist, but for a trick of fate back in 1989, when I had to decide on what I was going to do for a fellowship, there were no training jobs in, in nephrology or kidney medicine. So I, taught, I, I took what I thought would be next best in diabetes and endocrinology, because diabetes is the commonest cause of kidney disease. Of course, I, I made the very best choice, all deference to you, uh, Nadia. Uh, I spent two years at, in London, England, at the lab of Dr. Giancarlo Viberti, researching tiny amounts of albumin or protein in the urine. And that was where the concept of microalbumin was born. We now know, we, we learned back then that, that a little bit of albumin in the urine wasn't a good thing and foretold the development of kidney disease later. And we also know that it was, is, is, is generally uh, an adverse marker for prognosis. And of course, all of that we well know now, and it brings us to the favorite slide. This same slide has had different headings in three previous weeks, Nadia. We've done it with the heart, we've done it with the eye, uh, we've, done it, we've, we've done it with cholesterol and lipids, and now we're doing it with kidney disease. So, you know, if you're smoking, quit. Um, if your sugar's not to target, then we're with you to work on getting it to target. That's an A1C less than seven and a time and range greater than 70%. If, you, if your blood pressure, if the top number's above 140, that's a problem. Maybe you need more medications, talk to us about it. And if you're not on a cholesterol pill, you should be unless there's a good reason. Um, so uh, now it's time for me to, oh, let's, let's, let's do a few slides. So what, I'll tell you about what uh, kidneys at, at, at BC Diabetes. Well, we test your kidneys every year. Um, every year, everybody gets a, a, a requisition with lots of stuff, including ApoB and liver and thyroid. We measure EGFR, and greater than 60 is normal. We also measure sodium and, and potassium in your, bloods, in your blood. I don't know if we'll get to discussions about that. Sodium tells us how much water is in your body. Potassium can sometimes increase in people with kidney disease. And we also measure the amount of albumin in 
your urine. That is called a UACR test. And a normal test is less than three. If your EGFR is less than 30, we will usually do it every three months. And if it's lower still, we might do it every month. We'll combine it with other tests, potentially a kidney ultrasound to rule out obstruction, a kidney stone or, or maybe prostate disease interfering with your kidneys. And then ultimately, if your kidney function gets low enough, or if we're concerned about it and don't know what we're going to do, we're going to send you to someone smart like Nadia who will take care of you. How is, how is kidney disease classified? I don't want to steal her thunder, but I'm just going to throw it out there. The first thing we look at is the EGFR. The EGFR is the horsepower of your kidney to get rid of poisons. Greater than 60 is normal. And then 45 to 60 is the first stage of kidney disease. 35 to 45 is more serious. 15 to 30 is, is, is more serious still. And if, it's, if the EGFR is below 15, then that means your kidneys have had it. And you'll either have to go on, uh, go on dialysis, get a transplant, or go to heaven. And I'll leave Nadia to talk more about that. Um, what, what do GFRs look like at BC Diabetes? We decided to, to just look at people with type 2 diabetes, though the numbers will be similarly distributed in type 1 diabetes. This slide shows the proportion of patients who've got normal kidneys at the top then going down through the various stages to the bottom. And you can see that almost 70% of individuals with type 2 have no reduction in GFR at all. Uh, you'll notice that there are two colors, there's blue and there's brown. The brown represents the, the patients within each group who are on this class of drug, the SGLT2 inhibitors. That's empagliflozin, canagliflozin, and dapagliflozin. So we use these drugs in a lot of people. And you can see that you know, about two thirds of, of all of you are on these drugs. We don't use it uh, when, when the kidneys are in, in stage five, that's because it's not considered safe to do so. What about uh, testing your urine for UACR? So uh, a normal level is less than three. If it's between three and 20, it's so-called microalbuminuria, and that's what I studied 30 years ago in London. And then if it's above 20, we think you've got common or garden variety diabetic kidney disease. And that was that level of microalbumin was detected by the old fashioned dipstick. So it's, it's, it's called proteinuria. What's the distribution of UACR at BC diabetes? Here you see it. So 49% of, of people with type 2 have a completely normal microalbumin. In fact, you can see that Luke, who's our producer, use the normal range of zero to two, I prefer zero to three. So let's say, let's say 50 something percent of a normal, and then 30% 30, 30 have got the microalbumin range, and then uh, another 15% have got uh, significant amounts of, of uh, protein in their urine. Well, that's enough uh, of an introduction about kidney disease, because we have a specialist who's gonna tell us all sorts of about it. Let's let, let me tell you a little about little bit about Dr. Nadia Zalanado. I first met Nadia when, when she was a UBC resident in internal medicine in the mid 1990s, uh, in the late 1990s, and she uh, and a co-worker uh, were very diligent in putting together an insulin adjustment software package called Insujust that was just a little bit ahead of its time. We tried valiantly to get one of the uh, finger poke meter companies to incorporate it uh, into their device, but they were all way too scared about, about legal consequences of people giving themselves too much insulin and passing out. How ironic that uh, it's only in the last couple of years with the development of CGM uh, that, the, that, that big pharma and technology companies have been willing to incorporate automatic adjustments. Um, Way back in 1999, it was clear to me that Nadia had the right stuff as a physician. She went on, went on to complete her fellowship in nephrology or kidney medicine at UBC in 2004, and then went to Harvard, where she completed a master's in epidemiology 
at the School of Public Health. She's been on VGH staff since 2006, where she's been director of the kidney clinic for many years. Her research focus is on chronic kidney disease, renal artery stenosis, cohort studies, and hemodialysis. Nadia is married to Peter, an anesthesiologist at Surrey Memorial Hospital. Her special interests are cooking and gardening. Nadia, welcome to the weekly and to our viewers. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's really a privilege uh, for me to be able to join you uh, here to speak with you about my favorite topic uh, today, um, diabetes and, and how it affects the kidney. So I have a few slides uh, to make some general comments. And then, uh, of course, I'm open to questions uh, from, from your clients. So thanks very much again. Next slide, Luke. So the uh, five areas I'm going to cover briefly are firstly, an overview of what the kidneys do, how common diabetic kidney disease is and what are the risk factors. And from all of these um, session, sessions you've been having uh, with Dr. Tom, uh, you already know these well, I'm sure. We'll talk briefly about um, screening for kidney disease and, and diabetes, just elaborating on a few comments that uh, Dr. Elliot just made. We'll talk about treatment and then um, advice on when consideration should be given to seeing a nephrologist. Next slide, please. So let's start with the first piece, what do kidneys do? So I think we all uh, think of the kidneys as the waste removal organs. So they do remove waste and excess water by producing urine. And to do this, the kidneys receive an impressive amount of the blood that your heart pumps out with every heartbeat. About 20% of the blood goes to the kidneys. But the kidneys do a number of other things, and um, this becomes important, of course, when kidney function goes down. So we rely on the kidneys to control our electrolytes, including sodium, potassium, calcium, and phosphorus. The kidneys also control the acidity, or pH, of the body. So people with low kidney function can get an accumulation of acid in the blood. They're an important uh, part of the blood pressure control system, they stimulate our bone marrow to make red blood cells by producing a hormone called EPO, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. And they also have an important role in keeping our bones healthy. Next slide, Luke. So kidney disease is one of these uh, silent diseases, I think, that not a lot of people um, think about. It tends not to get as much press as other things, such as heart disease, for example. But in Canada, kidney disease in general is actually fairly common with about one in 10 Canadians having some form of what we call chronic kidney disease. And the most common cause of that, the biggest drivers are diabetes and high blood pressures. About 30 to 40% of people with diabetes uh, or even more by some estimates will, developed, uh, will develop evidence of kidney disease. So that would be either some albumin or protein in the urine or abnormal kidney function. Uh, but most people don't go on to develop kidney failure. The particular risk factors for kidney disease and diabetes include a couple of things that we don't have control over, including our genetics uh, and the duration that we have diabetes, but also things that we do have some degree, and in some cases a great degree of control over, including high blood pressure, high blood sugar, obesity, and cigarette smoking. Next slide, please, Luke. So as you already know, uh, being followed by Dr. Elliot, and Dr. Elliot it's already uh, reviewed, that screening uh, for kidney disease in people with diabetes is recommended on an annual basis. Um, so why do we do this? Well, I've mentioned already that kidney disease is common in people with diabetes. And the trouble with kidney disease in part is that people really don't have symptoms from kidney disease until the kidney function is, in some cases, extremely low. Um, in other words, they probably won't develop symptoms on their own um, until it's too late for people to take advantage or um, have the most benefit from the treatments that we know um, can slow down kidney disease, which are most effective when they are started earlier. Next slide. So again, as Dr. Elliott mentioned, we screen for kidney disease in people with diabetes using two tests. The first is the urine ACR test. So this tells us about what we call the microvasculature, the little blood vessels, the tiny kidney filters that are actually doing the work of the kidneys. And when they become damaged in the setting of diabetes, they start to leak protein into the urine, and that protein is albumin. 
And in most people, it is the earliest sign of diabetic nephropathy. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that not all people with diabetes um, uh, causing kidney disease has an elevated urine ACR, but it is certainly, um, is certainly a very common finding. I've written on this slide abnormal as a urine ACR of above two. I did this to mostly be consistent with the Canadian diabetes uh, guidelines, but I must say I, I lean towards uh, being uh, with Dr. Elliott in using three as, as, um, as, as more of a threshold for abnormal. The second test we use is the EGFR test, and this tells us about the kidney function. Do you have reduced kidney function? This generally uh, will tend to occur after uh, the development of protein in the urine, but not always, and that's detectable by a blood test. An abnormal is a GFR test result of less than 60 milliliters per minute. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide because Dr. Elliott's uh, been over this at the beginning, but in a nutshell, in general, we don't consider people to have chronic kidney disease unless their GFR is less than 60, okay? Unless they have other evidence of kidney damage. In other words, if your GFR is 85, but you have a urine ACR of 40, you do have chronic kidney disease. Um, whereas someone who has a GFR of 30 would have chronic kidney disease even if they don't have any excess albumin in the urine. Okay, now we frequently get questions and concerns when people get abnormal test values, of course. And there are a couple of things to keep in mind when interpreting your test values and why it's important to discuss these um, abnormalities with your doctor. First of all, we don't make a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease from diabetes or whatever the cause is based on a single abnormal GFR test or urine ACR test. Abnormal results should be confirmed. And the reason for that is that in some circumstances, we can see temporary or transient abnormalities of these tests that go away when the test is repeated. So in the case of the GFR test, the GFR is sensitive to quite a few things, including dehydration hydration and certain medications. So in some circumstances, by adjusting these things and repeating the test, we can see that they normalize and the person does not have kidney disease. The urine ACR test can also be finicky sometimes in that it can be affected and therefore abnormal in a number of uh, circumstances, including very heavy exercise, urinary infection, fever or other acute illnesses, uh, very, very high blood pressure or very high blood sugars. So in general, if we get an abnormal test, we look for these reversible causes, we optimize them, and then we repeat the test to see if the abnormalities are persistent. The other point I, oh, sorry, Luke, just back for one second. Yeah, the other point I wanted to make is that while in general, we do consider a urine, uh, pardon me, an EGFR test of less than 60 to be abnormal and in the chronic kidney disease range, it is important to keep in mind that in some cases, a GFR below 60, um, especially when it's sort of uh, close to 60, let's say in the 50s, may not represent kidney disease in the absence of other evidence of kidney problems, especially in elderly people, because we can see GFR go down in some cases with healthy aging. Next slide, please, Luke. So this slide is meant to, uh, to, show, to show that, that, that very point. So this is a recent study published looking at GFR in healthy aging in, um, in, in European cohorts, where what we have here is GFR measured by a very accurate method called IOHEXAL clearance, but we can just consider this as GFR. And that's shown on the vertical or the y-axis, and I've circled 60 mils per minute as our threshold for abnormal. The dotted lines here, this lower dotted line is the one that I want you to focus on, this you can consider to represent what we would think of as really the lower limit of normal of kidney function for that age group. And what we see here where age is plotted along the x-axis or the horizontal axis is that once someone is in the age range of 65 to 70, the lower limit of normal of GFR is about 60. And then as we age, you can see that the line drifts below 60 milliliters per minute. And these are apparently healthy older people. So if you have a GFR of less than 60, the first thing is, do you have a reversible cause that accounts for that, that we can fix? Therefore, you don't have kidney disease when we repeat it and, and the number goes up. 
And the second question is, are you an older person? Are you in the elderly age group? In which case, if you don't have other evidence of kidney disease and your GFR is below 60, but you know, still kind of close to 60, you may actually not have kidney disease. So important to discuss these test results with your doctor. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna discuss on this slide how a kidney specialist thinks about an albuminuria result. And I tried, um, I tried to do this uh, with a picture um, where we start out the road with normal kidney function and a GFR of above 60. And we go on a meandering path that in some cases ends up at end stage kidney disease where the GFR is less than 15 and you need dialysis or transplant or you might pass away from kidney disease. And of course, along the way, we hit lower GFRs of 45, 30, et cetera. Okay, so these three people um, represented here have different urine ACR values. The person with an ACR, urine ACR of three is on a bicycle. So they're going to progress potentially in their kidney disease relatively slowly, whereas someone with a urine ACR of 30 is in a car, not a very fast car, but will progress likely quicker than the person with a urine ACR of three. And finally, someone with a very high urine ACR value, in this case I've indicated 300, is the one that's likely to, produce, uh, to progress the most rapidly. So if these people all, all begin at the same starting line with a GFR of 45, this person in the car or the person with a urine ACR of 300 is likely to reach, let's call it the finish line of end stage kidney disease the quickest. So we use it as um, a risk estimator of how likely someone is to progress to kidney failure over time. But I will say before we go on to the next slide that not all people with even very high levels of urine protein um, necessarily progress to end stage kidney disease, but they are certainly a higher risk group. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving on then to some comments about prevention and treatment of diabetic kidney disease. Uh, the first point really uh, that I wanna make is that kidney disease uh, is really a marker of increased cardiovascular risk. And in fact, most people with kidney disease are actually at higher risk of um, passing away, of dying from a cardiovascular event, such as a heart attack, than they are to progress to end stage kidney disease. So we use this as a marker, as a flag uh, to say, hey, we need to really aggressively manage cardiovascular risk factors. So this goes back to Dr. Elliott's first slide. You need to quit smoking, manage cholesterol with preferentially with statin medications, optimize weight, exercise. And then we know that controlling blood sugar and controlling blood pressure uh, not only can slow down the progression of people who have established chronic kidney disease, but optimizing these things early before the onset of any kidney disease uh, is actually preventative. It reduces the risk of developing kidney disease in the first place. Now, of course, um, we do individualize our targets for blood sugar and blood pressure uh, to some extent. For blood sugar target, hemoglobin A1C for most people is less than 7%. And I put the blood pressure target here uh, of less than 130 uh, over 80, but you know, um, definitely we want the blood pressure to be less than 140 for kidney outcomes for sure. Next slide, please. Okay, now we also um, have two um, types of medications that specifically delay the progression of chronic kidney disease in people who have established kidney disease and diabetes. Those two groups of medications, so the first one is the inhibition, the inhibitors of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And under here we have ACE inhibitors, so medications that end in pril, like ramipril, lisinopril, etc. Or angiotensin receptor blockers, those are the medications ending in sartan, like losartan or valsartan. These are the first choice medications for high blood pressure and diabetes. And in addition, um, the first choice medications for people that have any degree of albuminuria, both in type one and type two diabetes, even if they don't have high blood pressure. Um, for many years in, in the field of diabetic kidney disease, things have stagnated actually, uh, in that that's really was our armamentarium. Uh, 
until the last couple of years where um, we've really had a lot of data accumulating on the benefits of the SGLT2 inhibitors, the gliflozins uh, that Dr. Elliott mentioned and that many of you I'm pleased to see are, are taking um, in the clinic. And these uh, medications initially um, received a lot of press as reducing cardiovascular risk in, in people with, uh, with diabetes and, and, and cardiovascular disease or at high cardiovascular risk. But last year, a major study was published that actually showed that use of these medications in people with diabetes and chronic kidney disease who had protein in the urine actually uh, um, had a reduced risk of progressing to end-stage kidney disease and dying. Um, in, when they were taking these medications in addition to an ACE inhibitor angiotensin receptor blocker. So for us in, in, in nephrology, in the field of diabetic kidney disease, this has been a major win, we feel, um, for, for people with diabetes. Next slide. So this, this slide is, is uh, just meant really as a reminder for me uh, to discuss that what we know about people with kidney disease in general, and, and not just people with diabetic kidney disease, is that when people have reduced kidney function, their kidneys are more sensitive to becoming damaged in the setting of acute illnesses, especially when they become dehydrated. So if someone with kidney disease is not able to eat or drink normally, has vomiting or diarrhea, we know that their, their, their kidneys get into a dehydrated state and they're at higher risk of damage. Then on top of that, we often have people on medications that in general are beneficial for blood pressure, uh, for diabetes, um, but those medications in the setting of dehydration can actually contribute to kidney injury. So in general, we give advice uh, to people that if they're on an ACE inhibitor, if they're on um, diuretics or, or water, med you know, uh, water pills, angiotensin receptor blockers, if they're on SGLT2 inhibitors or anti-inflammatory pills, that those medications should be held during the acute illness for a couple of days until people are feeling better, at which point it's safe to restart them. So that's to reduce the risk of kidney injury. Also included on this list of medications to hold includes the sulfonylureas and metformin, but these medications don't cause kidney injury in, in this setting. They cause um, you know, other complications with blood sugar and in the case of metformin accumulation of acid in the blood in people with kidney disease who then um, become ill. So protecting people against more kidney injury in the setting of acute illness is an important thing we need to keep in mind in, in people with diabetic kidney disease. Next slide. Okay, so my last slide is uh, really just some general recommendations uh, about when um, it should be considered uh, to refer a patient to a nephrologist. And I should say that in most people uh, that come to, see, to come to see me as a nephrologist, I also work with a team um, that includes a dietitian, a social worker, a pharmacist, and a nurse, especially in people who have what we call progressive chronic kidney disease uh, with a lowering of kidney function over time. So one thing we always say is that just because someone has diabetes doesn't mean that their kidney disease is due to diabetes. And we always need to keep this in the back of our minds because our approach to someone with diabetic kidney disease is different than someone who has some other form of chronic kidney disease. So if the cause of the kidney disease is not certain, then referral to a nephrologist is indicated for us to consider other things and maybe even recommend the performance of a kidney biopsy to see what is going on to determine determine what the best treatment for the person is. People who are having progressive loss of kidney function over time, especially once their function is less than 30, so they're getting towards kind of stage four kidney disease, um, should be referred to a nephrologist in most cases. Not always, but, but mostly. Um, lower levels of kidney function are associated with complications that we are specialized in dealing with here uh, in nephrology, including anemia, problems with bone, electrolyte disturbances. And of course, there is a, a segment of people that is going to progress to end-stage kidney disease um, or kidney failure. And by being followed by a nephrologist and a kidney clinic, we help to prepare people for dialysis, transplant, or if those two treatment options are not the best option, we then assist people, we support them um, in, in, in their journey 
towards uh, being managed with dialysis and potentially passing away from kidney disease, which um, you know, certain elderly people, for example, who are frail um, and have other uh, comorbidities, uh, who we feel may not benefit from these other treatments, we give them what we call supportive, supportive therapy. Other things we do here is um, help people who are unable to remain on what we feel are kidney protective therapies due to side effects. So for example, medications like ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, which I've talked about, we generally want people with diabetic kidney disease to be on, can cause complications like high blood potassium. So we assist in the management of that. And so hopefully we can put people back on their ACE inhibitors, uh, for example, uh, so that they can still derive benefit from them. And uh, finally, we, um, we do a, quite a bit of high blood pressure, hypertension management here. Um, although um, if you're being followed in uh, Dr. Elliott's clinic, he, you know, uh, he probably would not need our help for, for hypertension treatment. But I did just put this as a guide because um, you know, we do do a lot of hypertension treatment in the nephrology clinic as well. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's my last slide. I'll stop there and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Zelenardo. Incredibly informative presentation. We do have a couple questions from our audience. We're gonna get straight to it. One of our guests asks, can your ACR improve over time? Okay, great question. Yes, your ACR can improve over time. Um, so two things. Number one, urine ACR can fluctuate over time. So the first thing is interpreting a, an ACR that is changing over time does take some practice and, and some skill. That's why, that's, why we, that's why we do what we do. But with blood pressure control, with blood sugar uh, optimization, we can, and, and with use of those specific kidney protective medications that I talked about, we can sometimes see what we call a regression or a decline in a urine ACR over time. Thank you. Next question is from Susan. She asks, if I go on dialysis, what are my chances of getting a kidney transplant? Oh, okay, great question. So, um, so I guess I, so a couple of things regarding kidney transplantation. Um, uh, one is that in terms of uh, determining whether someone is a candidate for a transplant, we have a whole um, a team that is specialized in, in this area. So just because you get kidney failure doesn't necessarily mean you'll be a candidate for kidney transplant. But let's, let's assume that someone might be a candidate. There are two ways to get a kidney transplant. One is you, you know someone, a friend, uh, a family member, who is willing to donate a kidney because we know that people with normal kidney function can live with one kidney. So you may have someone that is willing to be a donor. If the assessment for kidney transplant happens before dialysis in some, and, and someone has, before dialysis is needed, and someone's um, living, what we call living donor is suitable, you may actually be able to have a kidney transplant before you ever progress to needing dialysis. We call that preemptive kidney transplantation. And that all takes time to arrange. Of course, most people would say, sign me up for that, right? So that's part of the reason why we, um, we like to um, get to know people a couple of years before they get to the point of kidney failure so that we can put these things in place if possible. Now, a lot of people, of course, don't have a potential living donor. In that case, they would not be considered a candidate for kidney transplantation until they actually start dialysis treatment. Once dialysis treatment is started, um, they wait on what we call the deceased donor transplant wait list um, for a deceased donor, okay, so um, to come up. And the waiting time is dependent on a number of things. Um, blood group is, is, um, is, is one, of the, one of the important determinants. So, uh, for example, someone with a blood group of AB uh, would have a relatively short waiting time, whereas someone with a blood group of B um, has a relatively longer waiting time on the order of years. So the, the details of these things is hard to make specific comments on, but the most important thing I think I'd like to leave you with on the, on, on the transplant um, uh, topic is really that um, living kidney donation 
is, is um, where feasible, what we really, really try to encourage because it is safe for healthy living donors to give it, to donate a kidney and the outcomes are really excellent from living kidney donation. Okay, we'll be coming back for more questions soon. At this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marla Indesil, our Director of Research at BC Diabetes. Marla, please tell us about yourself. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> so I'm Dr. Marla Indusil, Director of Clinical Research at BC Diabetes. Um, it's been 15 years, we're going on 15 years that I've been working with Tom at BC Diabetes. I finished my medical school in 1985 and specialized in dermatology and dermatologic surgery, which I did practice for 13 years in the Philippines before moving to Canada. To say that the COVID pandemic disrupted our lives is an oversimplification. The world has turned inwards. We were forced to retreat from our daily affairs. And during our time of quiet solitude, we reflected on the priorities and values we as individuals lead, but also how society directed us to believe we must lead. Having been asked to, act, to speak on how COVID has impacted my life, I have three thing, themes that come to my mind that seem to simplify this complexity. The themes are cooperation, communication, and community. Allow me to expound. Cooperation. Government and health officials were tasked to guide us through this crisis. Social distancing and quarantine measures were enforced to mitigate infection rate and keep ourselves, our loved ones, and all Canadians safe. But these measures are superfluous, redundant, and unnecessary if we refuse to cooperate and we choose to disregard the health and safety of others for our own selfish belief. So let's cooperate, let's wash our hands frequently, let's wear masks if we cannot keep a six foot distance between the next person. Communication. Our values and beliefs are, mold are molded by the sources of information we subscribe to. While I respect that we all have the freedom to choose who to listen to and who to believe, we must tread cautiously and choose wisely. Social media can be misconstrued in many, 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 many instances. Be wary. Communication from official sources and health officials should be our primary source of information in navigating COVID. Communication has also been our ability to seek out other means to maintain our relationships, both professional and personal. We are fortunate that technology has progressed enough to allow us a platform to continue to communicate while we remain in isolation. Webinars is what we do have right now, is, very, is a very, very good example. Video calls with family and friends is another, and maybe sometimes more joyful. Finally, community. I have seen many, many examples of the best in humanity. Neighbors, helping neighbors, strangers, helping strangers. I firmly believe that we must continue to be kind to one another. We never know who may be fighting a harder battle. More importantly, being considerate of others also means we be considerate to ourselves. Do not let fear be your worst enemy by allowing fear to dictate your life. Be informed, not fearful, be mindful, take precaution, and most importantly, be kind. Thank you. Thank you, Marla. A very uplifting message. And I know I speak for everyone at BC Diabetes when I say that I am grateful to have you in our community. We're gonna get back to questions now. The next one is from Michael to Dr. Elliot. Michael says, my doctor says that I have protein in my urine. Then he said that I have to get my eyes checked because I have protein in my urine. Why? That's a great question, Michael. Well, Dr. Zalanato talked about the little blood vessels in the kidneys getting affected by sugar. Well, there are little blood vessels in the back of the eye get, that get affected by sugar as well. Uh, and the nerves have the same issue. So we, 
we know that people who've got protein in their urine have often got little hemorrhages at the back of their eye and they've got damage to their nerves. Neuropathy, that's what we did uh, last week with, uh, or two weeks ago with the podiatrist. So that's why if you've got protein, it's, it's, a, it's a red flag for everything else. So we want to up the ante, get your sugar better, get your blood pressure better, all those good things. Thank you, Dr. Elliot. The next question is, I am both hypertensive and diabetic, but both are under control. Do I have a greater risk of kidney failure? Dr. Zelenardo. Um, so compared to someone the same age as you that does not have high blood pressure and does not have diabetes, you would be at higher risk um, than that person. But if your risk factors are well managed and you, you, um, you, your GFR is normal and you don't have excess amount of albumin in the urine, at this point, we would assess your risk with well-managed risk factors um, to be low. You're in kind of like the green zone, right? Normal GFR, no protein in the urine, well-controlled blood pressure and diabetes, but not zero risk. Okay, very interesting. The next question is, is for Dr. Zelenardo again. The question is, if my EGFR is 30 today and it was 40 two years ago, can you predict how long it'll be before I have kidney failure? Okay, so there are certain risk prediction tools that we have. Um, I, um, where what, what, what we do is we enter um, into a calculator that has been derived from large uh, studies of people with kidney disease um, that determines someone's risk of progressing to kidney failure over the next two years and the next five years. So with the two numbers that you've given me, that's not really enough information um, for me to answer that question. But there are tools out there, and I'm certainly happy to send, send the link to the group um, uh, um, for, for, you, for you to use the tool. Now, yeah, so I think I would leave it at that. The, the risk really would be depend, dependent on your blood pressure, how much protein you have in the urine, your age, in addition to your, to your EGFR test. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Spencer. Dr. Zelenardo, if I have to go on dialysis, how do I decide whether I should go on hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis? Okay, that is also a very good question. So, so, um, so this sounds like someone that may, maybe is already seeing, seeing a nephrologist. We, we do spend quite a bit of time in the kidney clinic with our team, working with our clients to determine what the best option for them is. And it is really personal. Um, in general, if someone is um, quite independent, uh, working, um, active, what we try to encourage is that they, they take a, a dialysis treatment that allows them to remain independent and ideally at home. And you can do both peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis at home. Uh, the peritoneal dialysis in general is simpler, but both of them can be done at home. So, so our first approach is how can we keep this person as independent and as close to their, uh, to their regular previous non-dialysis life as possible. Then there might be characteristics of, uh, about the person where uh, we sway towards one type of dialysis or the other. For example, someone may have had a history of um, a lot of surgeries on the abdomen. Maybe they've had um, resection, uh, you know, a surgery to, to remove a, a bowel tumor, or um, maybe they have a colostomy. Um, if there have been a lot of problems with the, with the belly, in some cases, peritoneal dialysis is not possible. Um, that being said, there are relatively few contraindications to peritoneal dialysis. So when people see us in the clinic, we, we educate them about what each is really like, and we try to encourage them to make the decision that they feel is right for them once they know about what the modality um, uh, is all about. But in general, we feel that they're equivalent therapies. So it's really about choosing what's right for you. Very interesting. Okay, the next question is from Roger to Dr. Elliot. 
at what level of EGFR should I stop taking metformin? <laughs> Thanks, Roger. Maybe that one should have been for Dr. Zelenado, but I'll give you my two bits. Um, the United States, which is the most litigious country on earth, um, has warned every doctor that metformin and reduced GFR is a no-no. So um, we in Canada are much wiser uh, and, and better guided. So I personally am happy to continue some metformin way down to a GFR of 20. Now it might just be 500 milligrams, one pill in the morning, one pill in the evening. So we, we know that it can be done very safely. And we know that metformin is a fantastic drug for lowering sugar. Uh, so, so um, Nadia, have I uh, committed perjury here? No, I, I completely agree with you that, on that. Um, the only thing I would add is that in people with the lower levels of kidney function, um, in my clinic, we would consider that to be one of the sick day medications because if someone with kidney disease who's on some metformin becomes ill, they are at higher risk of developing lactic acidosis, so buildup of acidity in the blood, which can make people quite sick. Um, uh, so, but, but beyond that, I completely agree with, with your comments about the use of metformin. Thank you. Okay, it's time for Arthur's Corner. Dr. Weisinger, who's our staff scientist, will be discussing sea snail and human hybrid insulin today. Arthur. Thank you, Tristan. Today I'd like to talk with you about a new form of insulin that's a hybrid between human insulin and the venom of a predatory cone snail. Slides, please. Nearly a century after the discovery of insulin, an international group of researchers has announced the development of a small, fully functional hybrid mini insulin that is extremely fast acting. This finding is expected to jumpstart the development of new insulins that can improve the lives of people with diabetes. Slide, please. The cone snail. The cone snail releases its insulin venom into the water where it causes the blood sugar of fish to fall very rapidly. This paralyzes the fish, allowing the snail to eat it. Just in case you're asking, I did not make this up. The snail venom is weaker than human insulin, but it acts very quickly. So the research team combined elements of some snail venom with elements of human insulin to produce a new hybrid product. Slide, please. To produce this new insulin, the researchers did a very interesting piece of genetic engineering and developed a synthetic molecule that incorporates a part of the snail venom that binds strongly with insulin receptors in the body. They also removed part of the human insulin that causes clumping, which normally slows down the activity of the insulin in the human body. The result is a hybrid insulin, which is small, fast, and powerful. Thanks, Luke. Because this hybrid insulin acts so quickly, it is expected to be especially useful in insulin pumps and in the looped artificial pancreas where fast acting insulin is essential. So from today, pay attention to your blood sugar. I'll see you again next week. Thanks, Arthur. See you next week. The next question is from Anne for Dr. Zalinardo. It seems like exercise can lead, lead to protein leakage. Is it dangerous for a type one diabetic to continue intense exercise that leads to protein leakage? Could the exercise damage the kidneys themselves? Okay, that's actually an excellent question. I'm glad you brought that up. So the, the protein that leaks into the urine during intense exercise um, is, is a temporary transient phenomenon uh, in someone that doesn't otherwise have protein in, in the urine. And it's not exactly clear why it occurs, but it's probably hormonally mediated um, um, you know, at the microscopic level in the kidneys. Now, so, so definitely we, we encourage exercise uh, reg regardless of the stage of kidney disease and to maintain general health. Um, the only comment I'd make about vigorous exercise is that we do know that dehydration, uh, severe dehydration can cause kidney damage. Um, so I would be more concerned about that piece to, to make sure that when you're vigorously exercising that, that you're hydrating yourself afterwards but I, I wouldn't stop exercising uh, just because of this temporary leakage of protein that we can see during that time. That's not cause, that's not thought to be uh, damaging to the kidneys. 
Thank you, Dr. Zalinardo. Guests, we'd just like to announce to you that we're going to be going about 15 minutes later than usual today. We have a lot of really great questions and we're on fire. So obviously it's up to you whether you want to stay or not, but we just wanted to be forthright and let you know about that. The next question is from Talia to Dr. Elliot. Is diabetic nephropathy reversible? Thanks, Talia. Well, I think Dr. Zalanato is going to have the last word on this as well. But I think she's already told you that you can get regression. So if blood sugar and blood pressure control is really good, the, the UACR can drop. Um, I, I'm going to ask Dr. Zalanato to tell us whether the EGFR can improve through good control. Nadia? That's, that is actually a very good question. So definitely the regression of proteinuria is very well described. Um, you know, GFR, um, we definitely can see GFR stabilize, even in people with fairly significant compromise in kidney function for many years. Um, I would say that seeing GFR actually increase though, once it has um, once it has declined to an abnormal level would be a lot less common, but certainly we can at least see stabilization. Thank you. The next question is from Suzanne, Dr. Zalonardo. My doctor said that I had protein in my urine. What else causes protein in urine? Is it just diabetes? Uh, no, and, and so that is also, that, thank you for that question. So, so that is really the, the key um, in, in someone with diabetes is when we see someone with diabetes presenting with protein in the urine to think about, okay, is this what I expect? Is this protein there due to the diabetes or could it be something else? So what else leads to protein in the urine? Well, high blood pressure, even in the absence of diabetes, can cause what we call sclerosis or scarring in the kidneys and people can leak protein in the urine. There are also a number of other types of kidney disease. Um, a common group of diseases would be uh, autoimmune diseases, for example, uh, lupus, which many of you have probably heard of, where we see specific forms of kidney disease that also manifest with protein in the urine, but it's not diabetes. So if someone has diabetes and lupus, we need to be very careful that we're not making an error and saying, oh yes, of course, they have diabetes, their problem is diabetes. There are other diseases as well. For example, um, people can have abnormalities of their bone marrow. Um, you might've heard of a disease called multiple myeloma where um, we produce, the body produces too much protein that gets stuck in the kidneys and that leaks into the urine and that, that, um, that, can, be, that can be another cause of, of protein in the urine. So the, the causes of protein in the urine um, are, are actually quite vast. And our job as, as your, your doctors um, is really to make sure when we see you and we see the protein there that we're giving consideration to other causes. One uh, signal that it might not be diabetes causing the protein would be the presence of other abnormalities in the urine, such as microscopic levels of blood. Now, some people with diabetic kidney disease can get blood in the urine, but certainly um, if, if there's blood in the urine, um, that would be a signal at least to think about whether it could be something else. And other signals would be um, the severity of the protein in the urine. So oftentimes we say if the protein is very, very, very high, uh, think of something else. Um, and and another, um, another sign would be the rapidity of the change in protein or the rapidity of the change in kidney function. Uh, so if something is very suddenly changing, that, that should increase the suspicion that maybe it's not diabetes. Wow, what a great explanation. The same person has one more question. Should I be concerned if my EGFR drops after I'm started on EMPA, EMPA glyphlozin? Okay, so we expect, in fact, your GFR to drop a little after you start empagliflozin uh, or any of the SGLT2 inhibitors. In the studies that we have, the, the GFR drops by three, four or so milliliters per minute. And that drop is uh, what we call hemodynamically mediated. And really what it means is if you stop the drug, the GFR comes back up. So the drug isn't causing kidney damage. Now, 
I've also told you though that sometimes when people get dehydrated, these medications such as empagliflozin that we think are good for kidneys might actually contribute to kidney injury or kidney damage. So we have to be careful as your caregivers that if the GFR drops by more than what we expect purely based on the pressure changes that we expect from the medication in the kidneys, then yeah, we have to consider could the empagliflozin be a problem and maybe it's not suitable for you. Maybe your body doesn't react well to it. So we have to think about that. But in general, we do expect a small change in GFR. Okay, the next question is from Alexander to Dr. Elliot. If SGLT2 inhibitors are so good for kidneys, why are 30% of BC diabetes patients not on these drugs? <laughs> oh my goodness, you guys are really just finding our weak points. Well. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors um, can have side effects. The commonest one um, is peeing more. Some people are up at night for whatever reason, they've got a weak bladder, and if, 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 if they're up twice a night and it suddenly becomes four, that's a deal breaker. So some people can't take it because of symptoms. Um, other people can't take it because they get fungal infections for men under the foreskin and for women um, candidal infections in the vagina. They get recurrent ones. Once or twice you can do treatments, but if it happens all the time, uh, you won't do it. And then finally, it causes weight loss. So if you're skinny, um, weight loss is not a good thing. So, it, it, you know, if you've got kidney disease, if you've got an elevated UACR or a reduced GFR, then we're going to encourage you to take it and then, you know, eat more fatty foods. We don't, we're not going to tell you eat more starch, but eat more fatty foods so that you you don't uh, lose too much weight so yes there, there is there will come the day when it'll be in the drinking water i i, I you're right <laughs> okay the next question is from donald for nadia does a keto style diet cause extra stress on kidneys ah uh, okay so that's also a very good question you know um so many of those keto diets um and I'm not an expert in diet, but um, are very high in protein. And there is some evidence in people with more advanced kidney disease that a very high protein diet may actually not be good for, uh, for kidney disease. Um, basically, kidneys work harder when, you're pro when your protein intake increases. And so um, I think it probably depends on the, on, the, on the details of what you're actually doing with your keto diet. And in, in our clinic, um, we usually say in, in people who are interested in, in, in um, taking that, that sort of a diet, that they discuss it with our clinic dietitians so that we can make sure that, um, you know, that the diet is actually you know, safe, for, uh, safe, for the, safe for the kidneys. Okay, thank you. The next question is for, from Mark, Dr. Zolinato. No one has mentioned kidney stones. Do they cause kidney disease and is there a link to being diabetic? Okay, another good question. So um, kidney stones um, can cause kidney disease if the stone blocks the passage of urine out of your kidney. So if you get a, a what we call an obstruction that prevents the flow of urine, the pressure starts to back up in the kidney um, that causes the GFR of that kidney to go down. Um, and if that blockage is there for long enough, people actually get inflammation and scarring that occurs in the kidneys. So definitely kidney stone, in people with a history of kidney stones, prevention of kidney stones to prevent the chance that they're going to get blocked by kidney stones is something that we, we see people here for that reason all the time. Um, whether there's a link between diabetes per se and kidney stone formation, I must say I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure about that. Okay, thank you. One more question from Donald here. What constitutes enough fluid consumption besides water? How much water daily do you recommend for patients, Dr. Zolinardo? So in general, we recommend that people drink to their thirst because for most, for healthy people, um, 
our body regulates our fluid intake um, very finely such that if we are becoming dehydrated, um, the brain reacts to that and really drives up thirst. So in general, we tell people drink to your thirst, which for most people is probably, and they end up drinking somewhere between a liter and a half and two liters a day. There is no good evidence to say that aggressively drinking a lot of fluid is, quote, good for your kidneys, other than under certain circumstances. And one of those would be people with a history of kidney stones, because drinking a lot of fluid and flushing the kidneys, uh, let's just say, reduces your risk of kidney stones. So that would be one example where we do advise people to drink three liters a day. In people with low kidney function, so once we're approaching kidney failure, um, especially, the ability of the kidneys to eliminate extra water in the urine actually gets compromised. The ability of the kidneys to dilute urine goes down as kidney function gets, gets very low. And in those people, we, we often will have to tell them to restrict their fluid, usually to around one and a half liters a day, to prevent themselves from causing them complications due to diluting themselves down with too much water. So drink to your thirst is my general advice. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Elliot. When I was younger, I did not have as good control of my diabetes as I do now. Can my better blood sugars help reverse my kidney disease or is it too late? Well, I, th I, think, I think we know that it's, um, we can definitely reduce the protein if we do things right. And uh, I don't know if Nadia said this earlier because I've, I've been multitasking here, but um, I, I believe that even though we can't stop the progression of a kidney disease, we can kind of delay it so that the kidneys last longer. So I think there's a very positive message. Uh, Nadia, anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, it's probably true to say that once kidney function is very low, um, you know, the benefits at that point of, of uh, you know, more aggressively controlling your blood sugars are lessened. Um, but certainly, I absolutely agree with Dr. Elliott that stabilization and slowing of progression, we certainly can see with better, better uh, control of blood sugar and blood pressure. Not to forget blood pressure, because that's very important too. Dr. Zelenardo, Ashley asks, why does smoking cause kidney disease? So smoking damages small blood vessels, okay? Um, it... it um, and it damages small blood vessels everywhere. And in a way, you could think of your kidneys as two bags of tiny, tiny blood vessels that are, that are filters. And um, because smoking causes um, the blood vessels to be damaged, those filters can't work normally. So I always tell people there is very little that your doctor can do for you that is as powerful as you quitting smoking. And that doesn't just go for your kidneys, that goes for your entire general health and, and, and cardiovascular health, of course, overall, and your lungs. Okay, can you tell if you have protein in your urine just by looking at the urine after you pass it? Uh, yes, uh, some people can tell um, because protein in the urine albumin specifically causes the urine to become very frothy. However, the frothing of the urine, we usually don't see until the protein is at a higher, higher level. Um, so we certainly want to, wouldn't want to use that as a screening test, but sometimes when patients come to see us and we don't have any urine tests yet, we ask them, have you noticed that your urine has become more frothy or bubbly uh, than it used to be? So that's what that is caused by. It's caused by the albumin in the urine. Thank you, Dr. Zalanar. Now at this point, we'd like to tell you about our petition that we have happening. So at BC Diabetes, we firmly believe that access to healthcare should not depend on a patient's ability to pay. So we have a petition that's aimed at the BC government to start covering continuous glucose monitors for type 1 diabetics through BC Pharmacare. Now, the Attorney General of BC, David Ebby, has said he's willing to bring this to the floor. So right now we're accumulating as many signatures as possible, and we're hoping that you'll consider signing it and sharing it. You can find it at change.org forward slash BC Diabetes. Again, change.org slash BC Diabetes. Now at this point, 
we'd like to go to Dr. Elliot for his closing monologue. Tom. Well, what uh, it's been fantastic having having uh, Dr. Zalanado. Nadia, we've never had as many questions as this, and we've never gone over time as we have today. So that speaks uh, that speaks to to just what um, a contribution you've made. We're, we're ever so grateful. Um, Next week, we will focus on all aspects of research at BC Diabetes and have our in-house experts, Dr. Marla Indusil, who gave you the little bio today, uh, talking, as well as Karen Fung, our human research protection expert, as our special guests. As our, uh, and the week after, we welcome Meg Soper, nurse, humorist, and motivational speaker, who will inspire us to be the best we can be not just during COVID, but at all times. We apologize for not being able to answer all questions live. Any unanswered questions we'll provide written answers to via email. Uh, that's the end of the show. Uh, viewers, we, we love you all and we're grateful uh, for the connection we have through the weekly. And Nadia, once again, thank you. Thank you. So at this point, we'd like to say a special thank you to our partners to Dr. Nadia Zalinardo, who is fantastic, and to you, our beloved audience. Have a lovely end of your week and enjoy the weekend.